Boy, have we got a video for you. And that's the gospel truth. Hello and welcome back to Meet Mozart. I'm Angie. That's Mozart. And today we're going to be diving into one of Johann Sebastian Bach's most famous pieces, St. John's Passion. But before we get to talking about the music, I wanted to go ahead and plug an event that's going to be coming up here in the next couple weeks where there's a recital that I had put together before COVID happened that I was presenting at different libraries, YMCA's, organizations. And it's a really fun program that focuses on three different Grimm's fairy tale stories. And we actually have a narrator who's going to be telling those stories. And throughout the telling, we're going to be interjecting with a lot of art songs that have to do with what's going on in the story. And it's going to be a really fun event. All the proceeds are going to people who have been suffering from long-term symptoms from COVID-19. And we'll be sharing that video on April 10th at 3 p.m. Eastern. But we're also going to have some extra events as well. One where I get to sit down with uh, my dear friend and wonderful pianist Anna Vasilyeva, who you're actually going to see later in this video. And she and I will be discussing the program and how we put it all together. And then we'll also have a separate talk with two living composers, first Ellen Mandel, who we have featured on the channel before, as well as Tom Chapulo, and both of them have some really great pieces that we're going to be including on that program, so you get to hear from them as well. Um, I'll go ahead and put a link to the Eventbrite page so you can find out more, and we hope that you'll join us for that really special and wonderful event. And now, on to St. John's Passion. The tradition of presenting passion pieces is one that began in Germany in the late 16th and early 1700s. And it's one of the many ways that German Protestants were taking traditions that were coming out of Italy at the time, such as oratorio and cantata, and adapting them to their needs within the context of church services. The term passion comes from the Latin word passio, which means to suffer. And that is why the early Christians used that term in order to talk about a very specific and extremely significant 24-hour period within the life of Jesus Christ. During this 24-hour period, he is betrayed by one of his disciples, arrested, tried, tortured, and crucified, only to rise again from the dead three days later on Easter, which of course is really the most spiritually significant holiday in the Christian tradition. In order to hear this story, Christianity relies on four different Gospels that were written by four of Jesus' followers. We have the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And although Bach did set all four of the Passion stories from all four accounts, it is the St. Matthew and the St. John's Passions which survive today. Congregations during Bach's time, and indeed even congregations today, would be very, very familiar with these Gospel accounts of the Passion, and they would have heard them every year multiple times, especially during Holy Week, which is the week between Palm Sunday and Easter Sunday. And traditionally, these texts would have been presented within the context of a church service in a chant form. But during Bach's day, more and more composers were starting to expand on that very simple chant format. And so in addition to the chant, they would add in some choir pieces and perhaps some solo pieces as well to kind of expand on the experience. But even in that context, Bach's St. John's Passion, which premiered during a Good Friday Vespers service in 1724 in Leipzig, would have been a completely new experience for the audience. First of all, it was much, much longer than any of the passions that they had been used to hearing in the context of a service. It's a full piece in and of itself. He also added a bigger choir and added different instruments to the orchestra. So it would have been clear to the congregation at the time that this was not just another church cantata, which Bach wrote on a weekly basis, 
but this was really a large scale master work by a musical genius. In order to tell the story, Bach uses only a few characters, primarily St. John the Evangelist, Jesus, Pontius Pilate, Peter, and a few other small characters. And the tenor singing the part of St. John the Evangelist actually follows the text of St. John. And Bach sets all of this narration in the form of a recitative, which would have been closer to the chants that people were used to. And throughout the story, as different things happen, these other characters pop in and out to continue the narration. So for example, if St. John says, and Jesus said, then Jesus says something. And so this is how the story moves forward and it is the core of the piece. But this piece, just like Bach's weekly church cantatas, was not just intended to review the story once again. It was designed as a musical meditation. And in order to do that, Bach started pulling in more sacred poetry as commentary on the narration. And so you have the story moving forward through these recitatives that the evangelist is singing, but then you have moments for pause and reflection where we hear this poetry that is sung either by a solo, soprano, alto, tenor, or bass, or perhaps even by a full choir. And what's amazing is that the people weren't just led to this deeper reflection by sitting and listening to all of this music they were actually invited to participate. Because one of the things that was very popular at the time and that Bach did quite often throughout his weekly cantatas was to include in the piece hymn tunes that were very, very familiar to the congregation. And he would take those familiar hymn tunes and he would play with them in a lot of different ways throughout the course of the piece. So you might hear it one time as a simple chorale or another time as a larger, more complex choir piece. You would hear it with different texts. You would hear it in different keys. And so he would morph this well-known hymn to fit whatever was going on in the narration at the time. And so people were constantly being engaged by this music that was familiar with them as well as these other pieces that they would have been hearing for the very first time. But what really makes St. John's Passion a work of genius is that there's never a moment in the entire piece when Bach isn't fully conscious of what's happening in the text and working to use as many musical devices as possible to paint a picture of what's going on in the story. And so he might do that by his use of harmonies or by the use of specific key signatures, or what he loves to do is something that we call text painting. And that's when a composer uses a musical device to literally interpret something from the text. And so, for example, in the soprano aria, Ich folge dir gleichfalls, or I follow you likewise, which comes after Jesus is arrested and a few of Jesus' disciples decide to follow the arresting party and also follow Jesus, is a piece that starts off with two flutes playing in unison, most likely because it allowed them to have a bit more volume, and a soprano. And the flute part begins with a lot of moving scale passage. It sort of starts to wander around. And it goes on for a while until the soprano enters with a very similar passage. And so now we've got these two parts that are sort of winding around and in and out of each other and creating what we would call in music a canon, which is where one voice starts with a musical pattern and then another voice comes in with the same musical pattern, but later. And so one is actually following the other. And so we have this canon-like movement that's going on between the flute and the voice. And then underlying it all, we have the basso continuo, which would have been an organ and perhaps a viola da gamba, that is supporting this movement in a way that sort of mimics the light steps 
of a dance. And so we have all of these different levels of following and stepping forward and moving that Bach actually paints that picture for us through the music. The world of music was constantly changing during Bach's time. And in fact, there are several different versions of St. John's Passion that were written in order to meet whatever needs there were with whatever ensemble he was working with. So for example, he might rewrite an aria to fit a specific singer's needs, or he might rewrite who plays what in the orchestra depending on what instruments were available. And of course, even since that time, the world of music has changed so, so much more. Originally, Ich Folge dir gleich falls would have been presented very differently. As I mentioned, there would have been two flutes, and those flutes would not have been the modern flute that we know now. They would have actually been the flute traverso, which is an older Baroque style of flute. It would have been accompanied by organ and viola da gamba, which is an instrument that's most closely related to the modern day cello. The soprano part would have been sung by a boy soprano because women were not allowed to sing in churches. The entire piece would have been heard in a slightly different tuning that actually can make some very significant changes to the tonal quality. And it was most likely performed by people who were in the same room with each other and not three different living rooms throughout the Northeast. So while I want to go ahead and mention that there are some really wonderful organizations that have sought to give the most accurate portrayal of how music would have sounded in Bach's time, and I'm actually going to give you some links to those organizations below so you can check them out, I hope you will enjoy this thoroughly modern presentation of Ich folge dir gleichfalls from St. John's Passion.
of course, one of the best and most special things about a work like this is getting to join voices with the people that you love. And O Grosse Lieb is the first chorale that we have in St. John's Passion. And it's a hymn tune that was popular during Bach's time and is actually still part of a lot of hymnals today. So even if you don't speak German, I hope you will hum along or sing your version of this beautiful hymn along with me and a few of my favorite people to sing with. Thank you all so much for watching and thank you to all my beautiful friends and collaborators for joining me on this little project. I'm going to put links to everyone's websites below so if there's someone you want to check out, learn more about, then please do. In the meantime, please be sure to like, comment, subscribe, push all the fun buttons including that little notification bell. And whether you're celebrating Easter, Passover, or just enjoying some warmer weather, we wish you a wonderful spring and look forward to seeing you soon.